Okay, I have a couple announcements this morning. We'll start with this one. On May 3rd and 4th, the MCC Mennonite Central Committee, thank you, is having their annual festival in Upland. Uh, they've asked for our help with donation of baked items that will be sold at the festival. These are such as can be store-bought or homemade. All items need to be packaged for individual sales. Pies can remain whole, of course, because what better way to have a pie? <laughs> Bread should be small, individually wrapped, and cookies should be bagged two or three per bag. Quitters, two or three, <laughs> depending on the size. Cakes need to be sliced into individual containers. If you are interested in helping, please contact Arrow for the particulars. Now, Arrow does not like to be embarrassed, which is why I always read these. So, Arrow, would you please stand so everyone can see who <laughs> they need to contact. <laughs> Thank you very much. Contact Arrow. Now, this is important. She needs to have these donations by May 1st. Okay? Okay. That's, yay, that's item one. Public service announcement number one, you guys will be glad to know that I replaced the batteries on that clock <laughs> Friday afternoon because I taught Friday, or taught chapel Friday morning and the clock wasn't working, poor kids. So, <laughs> the battery has been replaced, I am now aware of time, take that as you will. If we run long, I know we're running long <laughs> and just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, something a little more serious. I'm certain as anyone who has looked at the news uh, knows, um, yesterday Iran launched an attack against Israel. Uh, at the latest reports, I, I had a chance to briefly glimpse at them this morning. Uh, over 300 drones, missiles, and rockets were fired directly from Iran at Israel. In addition, uh, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, they all fired additional missiles. Praise God, virtually every one of them was shot down. Amen. Because he who keeps Jerusalem neither slumbers nor sleeps. Amen. So I would like to pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel I also want to pray for the Iranian people. Iranians are some lovely people, lovely people. But unfortunately, they have a maniacal government right now. And I can say that because that government in their charter says one of their core beliefs, their charter that they're found upon is to eliminate every Jewish person on the planet and remove Israel from being a nation. Today we're going to be talking about faith, so we can stand and smile in faith knowing that's not going to happen, because God says, once I replant them in the land for the second time, they shall never be uprooted and driven out again. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, thank you, thank you for the fantastic defense of your people and your nation and your holy city from so many rockets and drones and bombs. Thank you, Lord, that uh, the UK and the RAF participated, as did Jordan and as did the US. Lord, thank you for the friends of Israel who stood with her. Thank you, Lord, for Israel's defenses. Most importantly, Lord, thank you for you, for your defense of your people. We know that without you, we can do nothing. Your promises are eternal. Your promises are faithful. Lord, we pray for the Israeli people. We pray for those who know you as Lord and Savior, for those who know you as Mashiach, for those who know their own, their blessed Yeshua. We pray you continue to fill them with your spirit, give them peace, and let them be light in a dark place. For those who don't know you, Lord, we pray that your spirit would go forth in that land, that you would evangelize many, Lord, just as you sent Joseph to save many people alive, we pray, Lord, today you send your spirit throughout the land of Israel to save many people alive eternally. And we ask that also to be shed abroad in Iran. Lord, those people, all those who surround Israel, and even those in our own nation now who are 
shaking their fist at you and at Israel. We pray, Lord, open their eyes. We pray, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for a vast harvest of souls today, particularly in Iran. We pray that your people called by your name in Iran, believers would stand up, continue to evangelize, continue to tell those around them about Yeshua, about Jesus, about your love, about the cross, the resurrection, and your power to save. Lord, in the midst of darkness, we pray the greatest light this world has ever seen and a vast harvest of souls. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are in Hebrews chapter 11, part 5. <clears throat> so if you would, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to begin in verse 27. Now, I know Jerry covered this last week, but we've got to bounce back a little bit just to get some continuity into, into where we're headed today. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. The writer speaking of Moses here, and this is chapter 11, the hall of faith. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Speaking of Moses here, he forsook Egypt. Hold your place in Hebrews and turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. Are you surprised I didn't say Genesis? <laughs> I'll give you one day. Exodus chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as a wife a daughter of Levi, so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked alongside the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? that she may nurse the child for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, this is one of the things that I went over on Friday. And it is so amazing to both old people and children that I'm going to go over it again. Just to get the gist of this picture of Moses, in Exodus chapter 1, the Israelites were breeding like crazy, and it scared the Egyptians. They said, these folks, they're outnumbering us. Now, what if someone comes and attacks us, or what if there's civil war? They'll join with our enemies and wipe us out. So here's the plan. He tells all the midwives, whenever you see a baby Hebrew born, kill it. That'll be great, right? Wrong. The midwives don't. So Pharaoh calls them back in. So what are you doing? You're supposed to be off in these babies, right? And they said, well, the, the Hebrew women are so hardy that they give birth before we can get there. And he says, okay, plan B. Pharaoh tells his entire nation, the entire nation, when you see a Hebrew boy child born, throw it in a river. And guess what? They did. The midwives, however, chapter 1 tells us, because they had respect for God, God respected them, protected their households. So along comes this man, who marries a woman, bears a child. We know him as Moses. He's supposed to be thrown in the river, right? Well, he goes in the river, but not quite as Pharaoh expected. Puts him in the, in the, the ark, sends it into the reeds, 
Pharaoh's daughter comes down, finds the baby, opens the lid. The baby's crying. The strange girl comes over and says, sweet, you found a baby. You want me to go find a nurse? Okay, go ahead. Go find me a nurse. Bring her back. Have her nurse the child, and I'll give her some wages. Put this whole story together. The king, who said kill all the babies, was disobeyed. The king's daughter finds a baby who was illegally put in a basket to be saved, finds some strange girl who happens to be his sister. Can I find you a nurse? Sure, bring me a nurse. The nurse is Moses' mother, gives the child back to the mother, go home and nurse him till he's weaned. Oh, by the way, I'm going to pay you for that. Who can do that but God? Pharaoh says, kill all the babies. And God says, <laughs> watch this. I want to have your daughter bring the deliverer under your nose in your house. And you're going to like it. <laughs> Who else could do that? Amen. Now let's look at, where am I? Let's jump forward to Exodus 2.15. Nah, I can't do that. That leaves too much of the story on the table. <laughs> Verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he went out to his brethren, looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he's already claiming these as brethren. I suspect he thinks in his heart. He already knows God's going to use him to deliver his people. But God has not given him instructions yet. So he's going to make up his own. How many people in here, don't leave me hanging, can say you've made up their own instructions and they've been terrible? I have made up my own instructions and it has been terrible on numerous occasions. Well, here goes Moses. <laughs> he sees uh, an Egyptian beating Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian, hit him in the sand. When he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting, and he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh, cat's out of the bag. So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Moses feared Pharaoh because Pharaoh was going to kill him. He had good reason to, right? And so he beat feet. He went out to the middle of the desert. He went to Midian where he was for 40 years. Most of you know that story. But it's interesting. Hold your, hold your place in Exodus 2 or thereabouts. We might come back near that direction. In Hebrews 11, 27, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, wait a minute. This says he heard the wrath of the king and was afraid and he ran. There's a long life for Moses, right? As has been said numerous times, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Initially, Moses had fear of Pharaoh and he ran and he hid. And good that he did. Because Pharaoh was going to kill him if God hadn't intervened. But something happened. Something happened to Moses. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. And we'll begin in verse 1. Exodus 3 verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Pop quiz, whose voice is this? 
Jesus. This is the voice who spoke through the burning bush. And what is it? Oh, we'll get to that. Sorry. Getting ahead of myself. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And that, by the way, should eliminate any confusion as this, the angel of the Lord, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, or an angel of the Lord. If it was an angel of the Lord, he wouldn't have said, take your shoes off. This is holy ground and worship me. Amen. The fact that he said, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, most of the ites, I would assume. Now, therefore, behold, the city of the children of Israel is the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. We'll hold on right there for just a second. We all know the story. God calls Moses and he tells him, I will be with you. I will send you. He gives him instructions as to what to say and what to do when he gets to Pharaoh. Funny part of the story is Moses, who the scriptures tells us was mighty in wisdom and learning and word and deed. The man who was mighty in word tells the Lord, I can't talk. I have stammering lips. Personally, I think this is an excuse. The, 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 the Lord to send someone else. I, I can't talk very good. Huh. I'll send your brother-in-law Aaron with you. Anyway, that's a sidebar. <laughs> God calls him, tells him to go. And he's sending him to Pharaoh, right? In Exodus 5, verses 1 through 4, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it. When they get back to Egypt, it says, afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Go back to your labor. And of course, we know the rest of the story. There's the whole incident with Aaron's staff becomes a snake. The magicians throw down their staffs. They got tricks, right? They got skills. They match it. There's the water into blood. They got skills. They got tricks. Bust out some Pharaoh's Cake coloring, throw it in there. They matched it. Shortly after that, the plagues begin, and they can't match that. The ten plagues, water into blood, frogs, lice. It was at the point of lice when Pharaoh's magicians themselves said, this is the finger of God. This we cannot duplicate. You should let the people go. But he didn't, so they continue. And then there was flies. Now, by the way, frogs, lice, and flies. Does anybody like frogs, lice, and flies? No. I love the sound of frogs in somebody else's pond. When it's your house and you got to deal with it, sweet. I love frogs. When they're in my pool, I'm not a fan. When they're in my pool, in my yard, in my dishes, 
in my fridge, in my food, in my bed, in my toilet, in my hallway, everywhere. Not a fan. This is what God did with the plagues. They were everywhere. The frogs were literally everywhere except in the land of Goshen. No frogs in God's people's land. And then you had the lice. Lice. Batting, batting, little, biting little bugs. Now, does anybody else have these tiny, itty-bitty little new mosquitoes the last year or so? Oh, they're horrible. They're horrible. It's bzzz. They get in your glasses and your eyes and your ears, and they're everywhere, and they're hard to get rid of. They live in the grass. You walk through the grass. It's a little fog of biting things. Well, can you imagine them being in absolutely everything everywhere? By the bazillions, only in Egypt, not in the land of Goshen. And then there were flies. Need we talk any more about flies? Think not. Then the livestock was diseased. This one, God showed his grace, and he told the Egyptians, Get your livestock out of the field. Take it back to the house. Put your livestock away and it will be safe. If anyone in Egypt hears my voice and has faith in me and brings your livestock in, your livestock will be saved. But whoever's is left out will be diseased. And it was exactly that way. Anyone who went out, believed what the Lord had said, brought their stuff in, their cattle was unaffected, as was all of the cattle in the land of Goshen. Next, we get boils. Yuck. Now, this one's interesting. Moses gets a handful of dirt, throws it up in the air, the dirt, ash, fire. The ash spreads out, everybody gets boils. The magicians who were in the court with Pharaoh got the boils so bad they couldn't stand in Moses' presence, meaning they had to split. What's interesting about this one, we never see a record of Pharaoh telling Moses, please ask God to remove the boils. I won't let your people go and start over again. My impression is from reading of scripture, the boils didn't go away. They just kind of hung around through the next plagues. Nasty, right? Then we had hail, which burns when it lands. Interesting. We had locusts and we had darkness that could be felt. All of these plagues are attacking things that the Egyptians worshipped and revered as gods. God said, do you want gods? You want to make gods out of frogs? Have some frogs. <laughs> God's got quite the sense of humor. The last plague was the firstborn struck. This was the only plague that affected Israel as well as Egypt. But this one... had a method of salvation. Hebrews 28, 11, 28 tells us, by faith he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Some things we got to talk about Moses' faith. Up until this point, Moses has been obedient and all these plagues are coming upon them, right? The Egyptians. But so far, nothing has touched Israel. If Moses was like, the vast majority of the rest of us, Moses would think, okay, we've escaped out so far. We've been good. And the Lord gives directions, said, now you need to do this so that your people are spared. Otherwise, yours are going to be involved with the rest of them. I wonder how many Jewish people said, I don't know, I'm going to risk it. Well, how many people today hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, I don't know. I think I'm going to roll the dice. But the Bible tells us most. Many, many go the broad, easy path. Few, few find that narrow way. Nothing new under the sun. So, in Hebrews eleven twenty-eight, 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. This was for everyone, Egyptian and Israelite alike. This is where the Passover was instituted. This is where the Feast of Unleavened Bread was instituted. You take a Passover lamb and you kill it. And you take the blood and you put it on the doorposts of the lintels of the doors and the windows. 
And when the death angel comes by and he sees the blood on the doorpost and the lentils, he will pass you by. Otherwise, the firstborn of your house and your animals and your livestock would die. Everything associated with you as the head of the household, man and woman, firstborn of everything would die. The simple fix, if you want to call it simple, was putting the blood on the doorpost. But that was far from simple. That involved a sacrifice. That involved a spotless lamb without blemish, without broken bones. A little lamb who had never done anything wrong be killed and the blood used as a token of that sacrifice. And it was to be burnt and eaten along with unleavened bread, which signified they didn't know that that night. But you're not going to have time for your bread to rise because you're going to split tomorrow and you're going to split now when the command goes. So unleavened bread is basically crackers. So let's move on. When Moses ate the Passover with the sprinkling of blood, he was demonstrating to his household, to all of Israel and to Egypt that he believed in the word of the Lord that he believed the firstborn of his household would die, just as the Lord had said, if he wasn't faithful to do all that God asked him to do. And it wasn't just that, but many things that brings Moses into the hall of faith as an example to us. Let's continue to verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. We're going to circle back to this one at the end of the message. Let's go to verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. We all know the story. God told Joshua to send the army out with the priests, the Levites, in front with the Ark of the Covenant. They were to march around Jericho six days, one, one time a day, on the seventh day, they were to go around seven times. They were to stay silent. Can you imagine? I don't know how. I, I knew the number at one time. This is, you know, several hundred thousand people marching quietly without a sound. Man, you get two kids and one dog in a house, and it will not be silent. It will not be quiet. You get one kid and one dog. Can you imagine thousands of people walking in silence? This was intentional obedience. That doesn't happen by accident. On the seventh day, you'll go around seven times. When the priests blow the horn, you shall with, shout with joy and excitement, and the walls fall down. We know that, right? But verse 31, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who didn't believe when she'd received the spies with peace. That's a little bit of background to the walls falling. So let's go to Joshua chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. Joshua chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from the Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. Hold your place right there for a second. Joshua is getting ready to go into the promised land, and he sends out two spies. Any idea why he only sends out two? Because the last time they sent 12, and 10 of them came back as duds. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who brought back a good godly report. The other 10 stirred up the entire nation against God, against Moses, against Aaron, and caused them to wander in the desert for 40 years till their bones laid bleached in the desert. So perhaps Joshua learned his lesson. Well, we don't need 10 duds and two good reports. Let's just send two this time. <laughs> and it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out our country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who've come to you who have entered your house for they've come to search out all the country. And that much was true. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. 
And she said, Yes, the men have come to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Amen and amen. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I've shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sister, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us this land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, Get to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us to swear, unless when we come into the land... You bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. And so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. And then she said, according to your words, so be it. She sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. You talk about faith. Here are the two righteous spies. They come in, they're about to get busted. She hides them and she asks them. She tells them first the terror of the Lord their God and them as his implement is upon the whole land. And we know that the Lord's going to give you this city. So she asked for her family. And they promised her on the word of the Lord that they would spare her family if she did one simple thing. Tied a scarlet thread to her window. Scarlet being red. There's a whole long study on this which we don't have time to today. Suffice to say, this scarlet thread represents the blood of Christ. When we come back and we see this scarlet thread, we will spare you and all that you have brought into the house. She had two parts to play. She had to put out the scarlet thread and she had to convince her family, when war comes, come to my house. Has anybody ever tried to convince fathers and brothers and uncles to do anything they didn't really want to do? <laughs> Wah, 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 exactly. But she did, and she was faithful. And again, for that, she winds up in the hall of faith. By faith, by faith. Now, this is how the rest of the story works out. Oop, I got a little ahead of myself, sorry. As God calls Israel, lots of people, to cross the Jordan, it's not a trickle. This is at flood stage. So the river is probably at least a mile wide. Raging torrent, raging torrent. God stops the river. They go across. There's some very uncomfortable male things that happen. And then God sends them to Jericho. <laughs> We're going to stay away from that one. As they're getting ready to go into Jericho, Joshua had an experience. In Joshua 5.13, 
It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to meet him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Notice Joshua's courage. He looks up. There's someone with a sword drawn. What's his first reaction? Sound the alarm, run away? No, run to him. Hey, who are you? Are you here for us or are you here for our adversaries? And so he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. <laughs> and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. Joshua did so. Who's he talking to? Jesus, the commander of the hosts of heaven, the commander of heaven's armies himself. Take your sandals off. Not only does he allow worship, but he commands it. As he does to this very day. Amen. Turn forward to Joshua 6, chapter 1. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was secretly, securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho to your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all of your men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times and the priests shall blow the trumpet. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people will shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. I want to note a couple of things here. The city of Jericho was built on a hill, a very steep incline, and it had two exterior walls. One wall was about six foot thick, the other wall was about 12 feet thick. They were separated by a certain distance, and they were, I believe, it was about 35 feet tall. Two walls. One of them six feet thick, one of them 12 feet thick. God tells them on this day, when they blast the trumpet and they shout with a great shout, the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all of the people shall go up every man straight before him. If a six foot thick wall falls over and a 12 foot thick wall falls on top of that and it's on top of a very steep hill, what do you have? You got an 18 foot tall wall now. How are they going to get into the city? God is quite often more miraculous than the brief details he gives us in scripture. When God said the walls will fall down flat, he either disintegrated them or he pushed them into the ground. Otherwise, there would have been no getting over two layers of wall, 12 foot high as it was laid down. And by the way, it doesn't say it fell down and left little breaks and everyone feathered into that break. No, everyone will run straight up, meaning the entire city was laid bare, except for the section of the wall where Ruth's house was. Rahab, sorry, because her house was built on top of the wall. Between these two walls, they laid timbers, and people built their houses on the top of this wall. Well, that's where the corded thread was. That's where her house was. That's where her family was. That section of the wall didn't fall. But I've always thought that was very interesting. Is it, I thought about it one day, and it's like, wait a minute. That's 18 feet of wall. How are they going to get over that? God did something he didn't tell us, but he does say that the walls fell flat. Amen? All right, let's continue on. Uh, let's jump down to Joshua 6.15. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city, city seven times. 
And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab, the harlot, shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Hebrews tells us, by faith, Rahab obeyed the Lord and spared her family. Faith is a very important thing, isn't it? Without faith, it's kind of hard to please God. Isn't that what the Bible says? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Because when the Lord speaks and we don't accept it in faith, we are telling him, I do not believe you. As parents, some of my kids were more trusting than others. Some of my kids, I would say, oh, you got a splinter. Let daddy help you, and they would do that. Some would go, oh, no. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> One of my kids, we had, how long did we have to pray before we got that splinter? A long time. Trust daddy. Okay, I trust you. No, it's free. Okay, okay, well, then trust Jesus. Jesus, don't let daddy get the splinter out of my finger. <laughs> some were not very trusting, and sometimes it gets annoying. Let me help you. <clears throat> I'll do it myself. You're not going to be able to do it yourself. Let me help you. With God, he's all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, all-able, and all-willing. He did not withhold his only son from us. What good thing could he possibly want to withhold? And when he instructs us and we say, I don't believe you, that's an affront to who he is. And that hurts his feelings. You know, you can hurt God's feelings. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Father. You can grieve Jesus. Oh, I believe you're God. I believe you exist. But you're going a little far with that God. This trumpet thing, marching around, yeah, I think you're stretching a little far. This whole cross thing, some guy died. So what? Lots of people die. I, I, th I think you're stretching this a little bit, God. When God speaks, if we want to please him, we accept his word in faith. Amen? And that's what the Hebrews the Hebrews, that's what Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us. That this hall of faith, these men and women who came before us, humans, mortals, they ended well. Sometimes they didn't start well, but they ended well. Amen? Many of us didn't start our Christian walk really awesome. Some of us didn't have a very good middle. Some of us are getting close to the end. But I pray that all of us every day have a desire in our heart, this day, Lord, I will serve you. If this day we serve him, we will end well. Amen. Yesterday's gone. You don't have tomorrow yet. Serve the Lord this day, and you will end well if this is your last one. Amen. Now let's get back to the one I said we'd circle around to. Hebrews eleven twenty nine. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. I'm not going to read the entire Exodus chapter 14 as I'd planned to, but I'm sure most of us, if not all, are familiar with the story. The Lord led the children of Egypt, Egypt Israel, under Moses' leadership, the Lord led them, led them to a place at the edge of the Red Sea. The Lord led them there. Don't forget that. The Lord led them there. When they got there, Pharaoh with his army came behind them. And the people began to scream and to cry. Have you led us here so that Pharaoh could kill us by the edge of the sea in this desert? Moses went to the Lord and the Lord said to him, why are you whining to me? Start walking. Huh? Start walking. Lift up your staff. And we know what the Lord did. He parted the Red Sea. And interesting wording is used. 
By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Dry is Eretz. Desert. Dry. Powdery. Now if you take a pond and you let the water dry off, or let's say you've got a pond and you bring a, a blower and you blow all the water off, what do you have? Mud. How long are you going to have mud? A long time. If you're in Oklahoma, a long, 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 long time. You get that clay, it never dries out. Well, the Bible tells us they went across on Eretz. Dry land. It wasn't just pulling back the water that was miraculous. It was drying the land. If God had just pushed the water back and said, all right, now you all stumble through that muck and that mud and when you get to the other side, good on you. No, he dried it up for them. Not only that, but some interesting archaeological discoveries have been made. There's a certain place in the Red Sea, it's just a certain place, where there's a land bridge just below the surface. Not just below being several hundred feet. But that land bridge is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up the exact numbers. I know I should have wrote them down. A hundred feet wide, a couple hundred feet wide, and it's down several hundred feet. But on each side of that land bridge, it goes down thousands and thousands of feet, just a sheer drop. But in between these two sheer drops and these two abysses out here, there's a land bridge that runs from one side of the Red Sea to the other. With one beachhead, at the end of that land bridge. This way, there's no beachhead, there's cliffs. That way, there's no beachhead, there's cliffs. One way across this land bridge, there's a beachhead that's large enough for a huge amount of people to gather. And that leads them out into Israel. Diving ships have went down. And you know what they found? Chariot wheels. Chariots. Things that just aren't natural all along this land bridge. Well, the Bible tells us, I know Cecil B. DeMille did a decent job on his movie, but a couple of things he messed up. The Bible tells us that Pharaoh chased them across the Red Sea. The Israelites had gotten all the way through the Red Sea. They're on the other side. Pharaoh and his army chased them out the other side. When they were on the other side, they got scared. It might have been like a do 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 got to go. It might have just been a V8 moment. Like, we just rode through the sea on our horses and chariots. Maybe we should go home now. <laughs> because the Bible tells us Pharaoh and his armies turned around and attempted to get back across the sea when God closed it up on them and they died. When you talk about faith, we talk about Moses being in the hall of faith. Moses goes to the Lord, the children are afraid, you know, we're gonna die here. And, and God literally says, why are you complaining to me? Keep walking. Almost as if he said, go this way. Moses went so far and just stopped because he didn't know what to do. God says, why aren't you, why aren't you still walking? Hold your staff up and see the power of the Lord. Thank God for that. You know, we talk about following the Lord when he opens doors and closes doors. And I know most of you guys in here have heard me say this. My biggest prayer is that the Lord be much greater than my stupid. Because sometimes he leads me to an open door and I'll look at it and go, uh, Lord, I give you full authority, kick me through the door if I'm being dumb. Or if I'm banging my head on the door, please just get my attention before I scramble my brain and I can't remember anything else. I trust the Lord to be bigger than my stupid or my lack of listening or my busyness or whatever it is that stands between me and him. I pray that his Holy Spirit always get my attention just as he did Moses. So he pulls back the water, dry land, Eretz, they go through on dry land in basically the one place in the ocean they could go across, almost like God knew something. Let's give him that, he knew something. Up to the one beachhead where you could have got a million and a half people through. 
Again, almost like God knew something. But the faith that it took to do that was extreme for Moses and for the people. So let's say Moses takes his staff and he raises his staff and the ocean begins to recede. The ocean piles up into these walls. It's a dry path down there. Who's going to be the first one in? Well, Moses, I know God likes you a lot. You got the stick with the, with the whole water stand thing. What's he going to do when I go in? Are you going to go first? How do I know I'm not going to get halfway through and God's going to save you and not me? How do I know when the dude with the stick goes out the other side, God's not going to go, hey, hey, push. Because God told them in faith he would take them to the other side. Faith is the great test that we have. Faith is the proof that we love God and we trust him and therefore we are obedient to what he says. So the people followed Moses. Moses followed the Lord and was obedient. And they crossed over the Red Sea. And this is something that God reminds them and us constantly throughout the Old Testament and into the New. That God brought them through the sea. God brought them miraculously. This is a miracle no one can deny. No one even tried. Even Pharaoh didn't try. Even once he was dead. <laughs> Him and everyone he knew. The reason I circle back around to this one very last is because of the baptism we're having today. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him, and that rock was Christ. They were all baptized by going through the Red Sea. Well, how does that work? Well, the New Testament tells us that baptism is a symbol, an outward symbol of an inward commitment and an inward change. When we become Christians, we don't become painted up, gussied up, repaired, broken jalopies. We are not repaired creatures in Christ. We are not rejuvenated junk in Jesus. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus, amen? As Jesus told Nicodemus, marvel not that I say in you, you, you must be born again. We are not the old people with a little fixing. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's what baptism is a symbol of. Going under the water, a death to self and a resurrection with Jesus Christ in life. How do you correlate that with the Red Sea? Well, think about it. Countless times in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel would complain when things weren't going just right. Oh, that we would go back and eat. Oh, that we were back in Egypt. We had leeks and we, you know, we had carrots and peas and whatever the things they liked. Oh, that we were back there. Things were great. Well, the whips and chains weren't so awesome, huh? The dying by, by the thousands, the laws to kill your children, it wasn't awesome. That's why they were groaning. If it was so awesome, they would not have been groaning to the Lord to set them free, which he did. But here's the thing. Once that Red Sea closed behind them, there was no place they could go back to. A lot of people in Christ fear that at some point in their life they might turn around and go back to the old person. Well, I will tell you this. If you accept Jesus Christ and it's real and you are a new creature in Christ, there is no old place to go back to. Just as there was no way for them to get back to Egypt, God closed the sea behind them. The ruler, the one who had had power over them, the one who held the key to their chains was dead in the water, along with all of his army. If you are in Christ, the one who held your chains is dead to you because Jesus Christ stole his power, took his keys, removed his authority, 
That's why the, Peter tells us that Satan roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Please, can I devour you? Please, please. The Bible says, resist the devil and he shall flee. A simple no will suffice. May I devour you? No. In Christ, the answer is no. That symbolism, I found it very, very interesting that we were right here in Scripture today as we prepare for a baptism. What we do here today, Jesse, if you want to come on up. What we do here today is a continuation of a very long tradition. Because although they didn't know it at the time, the Israelites that Moses led through the Red Sea, that God brought through, God was giving that from that point on, that was a testament of life in faith to God. In the Old Testament, it was salvation by faith in the coming Messiah. It was never by works. It was by faith. The works were a demonstration of the faith that they had in the coming Messiah. Now we look back in faith at the Messiah who came, who once and for all sacrificed himself for sin, once and for all, and who has now sat down at the right hand of the Father. So as Jesse gets ready, and as I get ready, if you guys want to come, Am I going to need this setting on the shelf back here? Yes, okay, thank you. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord, it's your breath. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry 
So I'd like to invite Jesse's family if you want if you want to get close. Come on. If you're happy where you are, stay. <laughs> so Jesus told us to go into all the world, make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I asked Jesse today. Actually I asked him last week. You know, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And why now? And what's it mean to you? So. When Pastor asked me the question as to why now and what it means to me, um, before I even walked out the doors that day, I already had the answer as to why now. But what it means to me, um, I think that was a little more complex for me. See, like a lot of... Um, Hispanics, I was raised Catholic, um, baptized before I could walk or speak, first communion, confirmation, none of it by, by my choice. Um, it was just something that we were put through, um, not forcefully, but still we're, we're told that's what we're doing, so we did it. Uh, never really understood a whole lot of what I was going through or why I was doing it. Um, so it was more of a task than it was something that I really wanted to do at the time. Um, so the why, um, been a long time now, I've just felt drawn to the Lord. Um, like many people, um, been through a lot, seen a lot, a lot of sin in my life. Um, not proud of a lot of what I've done, but I know there is forgiveness. And so the why, because I, I did accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and being able to say it, is a lot easier now than it used to be before. Before it was just a task and now it's because that's what's in my heart. And as to the why now, the hardest part for me uh, for a while now has been the why now and why not before. And that's easy. My mother, Catholic, very stubborn, difficult. Um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of issues growing up, but I knew it was going to be hard for her to accept um, I was going to get pushed back, so I waited until this morning to tell her. And as expected, I, I got the pushback. Um, initially, really not, she didn't understand why. Um, we went back and forth for a few minutes, but I think she just, at the end of it, just like, 
well, you know, okay, it's your decision. So, and so be it. Now the easiest, I think, like I said, before I walked out the door, I knew the why now. I guess to quote um, something from the program, The Chosen, if you've all watched it, there was one, multiple times, a scene where Mary asked Jesus, why now? And his response was, if not now, when? So now is the time. Brother Jesse, as a result of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, your love for him as your Lord and Savior, and your obedience to his word in your heart, I would like to now baptize you in the name of the Father. As you guys know, the long standing tradition is he's going to make all of you as wet as possible. <laughs> Come get your hug. Father, thank you so much for this demonstration of, of another heart's love and desire. Help us to talk like that, that helps. Another heart committed to you and the desire to make that testimony crystal clear to the world. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And thank you for Jesse's heart and the privilege that we have of being here today to witness this. Ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.